call the meeting to order at 601. Uh, just trying to change my layout so I can see everyone on the screen. Okay, um, any adjustments to the agenda? I have uh, one executive session to add after number 10 uh, due to a student matter. So that will be item number, new item number 11. Okay. Don't Tammy, I promise I'll get times for you this time. Sorry about last time. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had them last time, um, but um, sometimes it's, imp so when right. I take them, just for an awareness of the board members, when I take the minutes, I always pass them to the clerk for a thumbs up on anything that is added during executive session or meeting time minutes. Um, and so if one of you happen to now be a clerk or um, in a future state are the clerk and you receive the minutes, the next thing is you pass the ball over to Christy once you approve them. <laughs> yeah, I thought I did that last time, but did not. So sorry. All right, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so we have not been assigning times. We'll just try and uh, get through this as efficiently as possible. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of Tuesday, April 19th and March 15th? Uh, so moved. And I'm here, by the way, Shannon. Hey. Hi. Hi, Andrew. You can take it back over. <laughs> I'll second I'll Andrew's se motion. <laughs> Uh, did you make a motion to approve both minutes or just the first? I did, yes. Um, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, Thanks Peggy? was staying because I wasn't sure. 100% on that point. All right. <clears throat> The minutes are passed. Okay, do we have any public comment at this time? All right. All right, hearing none, we'll move on to the board comment. Anybody on the board have any comment? Uh, I had one briefly, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Owen and myself and Lyle and and um, uh, Mr. Hubble met uh, I can't remember what day it was now, but we met to go over the facility right. committee. Um, and I get that uh, down again. We did uh, decide during our meeting to uh, create a living document that has been posted um, so that we can start getting feedback from the facility managers on the needs of the facilities. Um, so that's going to be kind of our first step. Um, I'll be reaching out to each facility manager here over the next week or two to help coordinate that with them rather than them have to um, go on with a list of items. I can work through them with some of those items. It's, again, I don't think we'll get all the items in, you know, in a period of a couple months. It'll probably take some time, but uh, as we'll get them, we'll meet again um, and prioritize some of those as well as assess the monetary value. Um, you know, hopefully we're, our goal is by budget season where we're firing on this. So great. So that's where we're at, we're going to work for that. That's awesome. <clears throat> um, does anybody else have anything else? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to speak. Uh, Since you have a quorum, I'm just I'm not feeling very well tonight, so I'm going to step out. Um, actually, I, I have COVID, and I'm just not uh, <laughs> just not feeling very good right now. So, uh, I'll see you all next month. Okay. Hope you feel Please feel better. better. <clears throat> All right. Well, just round to the celebration of learning. Yeah, so I, I can kick this off if that's all right. So as you know, one of our overarching goals um, for the SU, but also for RUD, is to strengthen our proficiency-based learning, personalized learning, and um, pathways programming. And so, you know, I think one of the exciting things about where we are as an organization and district is that we're really getting to build this now, um, which means that we're a bit behind in some areas um, in this work. But I think that we're able to learn 
from our colleagues around the state and uh, hopefully be able to build something that really speaks to relevancy, rigor, um, and increased student engagement. And so we were, we've were we been on a search for a pathways coordinator at the high school, um, really started last spring, and we're able to finally uh, find Mr. Boynton um, not until this middle of the school year. And so Ben's been doing a really great job of laying a lot of great groundwork here at the high school for us to be able to implement something that I think is going to be really special for our students. And um, with that, though, you'll you'll see in the presentation tonight is he's going to talk a lot about the work that we also have to be doing really essentially K through eight to get to where we want to be at the high school level. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our pathways coordinator at the high school. Thank you. I'm going to go over here so I can focus and I might get up and move around. So I know that might not be conventional here, but uh, I'm not good at sitting for a long period of time. So do what I got to do. So thank you. Um, Good evening. Thank you for having me, uh, making time to hear about Flexible Pathways. Um, as kind of Jamie set up, I have uh, stepped into this position on January 24th. Um, before I get into the presentation, though, I do want to thank Jamie and, and Reed McCracken for giving me the opportunity. It's really great. Um, love it here. Uh, I want to thank them and high school staff for ongoing support as I learn the ropes and provide support where I can and work on this building of vision and capacity. So pretty exciting. Um, there's a lot to share here in this presentation, so I'm going to ask you to hold questions till the end. I know that can be frustrating, uh, but I'll be happy to go back to different slides, talk about whatever you need at that point. Having done this with teachers, I can tell you uh, that if we talk as we go, it's going to take an hour and you don't have that much time, um, nor do you probably want to listen to me talk for that long. So uh, that said, thank you for your patience, for your attention. And uh, before we dig into flexible pathways at the high school, um, Jamie suggested, and I thought, or maybe I asked, I don't know, um, but we decided that a brief reminder would be in order. So, how is public education currently envisioned and implemented in the state of Vermont? The Vermont legislature in 2013 passed Act 77, and if this, is a, this is a reminder refresher course, so you may know this. Um, as written, the law was, quote, established to encourage and support the creativity of school districts as they develop and expand high quality educational experiences that are an integral part of secondary education in the evolving 21st century classroom. That's a lot of jargon. To promote opportunities for Vermont students to achieve post-secondary readiness through high quality educational experiences that acknowledge individual goals, learning styles, and abilities. And finally, to increase the rates of secondary school completion and post-secondary continuation in Vermont." End quote. This act uh, was the culmination of over a decade of school reform and legislative action. There are three central principles or approaches to education in Vermont. Number one, personalized learning. Again, I will quote, describes systems and approaches that deepen student learning by incorporating each student's interests, strengths, and needs, including student voice and choice in what, how, when, and where they learn to achieve the goals <clears throat> of active engagement, academic success, and preparation for post-secondary opportunities. End quote. This means finding ways to give students input and even sometimes control, self-direction, in and over how and what they learn. It does not mean every student has their own curriculum, however. What it means is that teachers and students work together to connect the curriculum to the learners. Number two, proficiency-based education is instruction, quote, aligned to proficiencies based on transferable skills and standards adopted by the state of Vermont. End quote. PBE takes the emphasis away from seat time and pays deep attention to knowledge and skill development. Proficiency-based can be manifested in lots of different ways. So as Jamie referenced earlier, we can learn from the people around us who are maybe a little farther ahead in some of these regards, and we can also make it our own. Three, personalized learning plans are documents and archives in which students reflect on their personal and educational growth throughout their four years in high school. Though sometimes this work starts earlier, even in some districts as early as elementary school. I've known some districts to start at, eight, at uh, grade four for PLPs. The personalized learning plan is the foundation of learning at White River Valley High School. It provides the thinking necessary for students to take ownership of their education and to guide their own learning throughout high school, including movement between traditional coursework and flexible pathways. In this way, it's the key to success for each individual student. These three principles make flexible pathways possible. So, what are flexible pathways? Flexible pathways are rigorous, 
alternate approaches to learning and demonstrating proficiencies required for graduation. They are planned, integrated elements of the White River Valley High School experience. Finally, they are for all students, no matter skill level, no matter interest, no matter the expected path after high school. High school pathways are for everyone, the highest achieving, the most struggling, and everybody in between. So for people who like visuals, uh, and I like metaphors, former English teacher, so uh, we can think of the White River Valley High School educational experience as two conjoined trees. So we have on one side the traditional tree, and we have wrapping around it the flexible pathways tree. So one tree is that traditional tree. It's the scope and sequence tree. It's the one we all know, right, from our own schooling, from when we were young, right? English, social studies, math, science, visual performing arts, physical education and health, world languages, all the electives, right? That's the, the old school thing that we all went through. The other tree, though, is the flexible pathways tree, and that's what we're going to explore together right now. So we have two trees representing our students' high school experience. Personalized learning and proficiency-based education are the environment, the air, the water, the sunshine. Personalized learning plans are the root system, right? feeding up the trees. And the reason for that is that it's planned, right? The best flexible pathway work is planned. And the best uh, traditional work is also planned and taken into account. So if they have the personalized learning plan and they know how that works, they know themselves as learners, they can make those choices and understand how to navigate. We all know, of course, that uh, trees need appropriate soil to survive and thrive. Here, K-8 learning is the soil from which our trees grow. Right? That's the next part. To seed in high school, that means students need not only fundamental skills and contact no content knowledge, excuse me, but also the ability to self-direct and self-advocate. They need curiosity and background knowledge, no matter which tree they're climbing at any given moment. So this is essential. Both trees must thrive. It's not, an, it's not an either or, right? Both trees must thrive. Some students are gonna grow best on the traditional tree. Some students are gonna grow best on the flexible pathways tree. But all students should be able to climb back and forth between the trees, gaining from both to varying degrees. So I'll say it again, both trees must thrive. There's no way around it. We know what the traditional tree looks like because we've all done it, right? Um, we understand its branches, all of those departments, right? Those core disciplines and the arts and all that other material that we study and get exposure to. But we need to understand the branches on the flexible pathways tree. So again, hold your questions because this one's gonna get a little long and I'll answer, I'm sure, some of your questions as we go along. This is the part where I'm gonna stand up because I need to move around. Um, so this image is an aerial shot, which is a little bit bigger, but you get the idea. Um, it's an aerial shot looking down on the trees, <clears throat> right? You can't really see the roots from above, but there's the PLP, I put it in there to have that reminder right there because PLPs are core to this entire project. There are nine branches on the tree. The traditional tree we see here part of, and we see its limbs kind of ghosting out because I didn't want to try to busy that picture. I want to focus on this. I didn't draw that for the record. Um, so there are nine branches on the tree. Some of these are already thriving. Some are just beginning to grow and some need to be cultivated to grow at all. I'm gonna walk you through them quickly because a lot of this is programming that exists and it's pretty impressive. That is to say, I was impressed when I got here and find out the things that were going on. The first branch over here is community-based learning. This includes work-based learning, volunteer service, journalism, job shadows, career experience, yeah, the list is long, workshops, resume and interview support, and classroom enrichment. I have a lot more detail about this from Ms. Waterman than we have the time to get into, uh, but I'll boil it down. More than 60 White River Valley High School students have participated this year in on-site work and in a wide range of programs with more than 50 business partners and nonprofit organizations in the area. That's, that blows my mind to say that out loud. Some of this work is for credit, some of this work is exposure to other opportunities, and some is volunteer work. Outstanding program, thanks to Mary Waterman. Um, I just, I have to say thank to her for her many years of service, as you know, she's retiring, but wow, very impressive work. The second branch is career and technical education, which is currently managed by the school counselor. Uh, we work at two schools, as you probably know, the Randolph Technical Career Center, at which we have 16 students in seven different programs, and three students in the pre-tech career exploratory program. Our second school is the Hartford Area Career and Technology Center, in which we have four students in three different programs. If I'm going too fast, let me know. Third branch is adult ed, adult education. 
Vermont Adult Basic Education and their high school completion program. This is kind of co-managed. Sometimes Mr. McCracken takes it on. Sometimes I've taken some contact on. Sometimes Nicole Lamoth, school counselor, is doing some of that work. We're, we're kind of teaming on that one. So adult education, if you don't know, is a state program that's available to students across Vermont. It's a pretty solid program, but it requires serious commitment from students and sort of getting, getting yourself there. And there's, there's a lot of facets to that. So what we do is we support uh, and help prepare students for the program if we, with the student and the family, determine that it's the best option for completing the learning and work required to earn that diploma. Currently, we have six students enrolled in the adult ed program, and we have three other students who are kind of checking it out, doing the testing, seeing if it's going to work for them, so exploring their options. Fourth branch is the personalized learning classroom. That's a self-contained uh, personalized learning space downstairs. And this is for students with qualifying disabilities who have difficulty succeeding in the regular classroom. Students are referred by staff following a specific protocol. And the idea for this pathway is that it would be temporary, that eventually students in the program will transition back to the regular classroom. And in fact, Mr. McCracken has reminded me that a lot of the students who are in that program are not there all day. Most of them, I believe he said, they're not there all day. They're doing some regular classroom work and they're doing the personalized learning classroom uh, space as well. Ideas for students to trans transition back, but of course, there are exceptions. Um, the PLC this year has served 20 students over the course of the year, some short term, some still there. <clears throat> Fifth branch, where I've spent a lot of time lately, is virtual study, which is managed mostly by me, Flexible Pathways Coordinator, with some support from the school counselor. The organization we work with most is the Vermont Virtual Learning Cooperative, which you probably know from the pandemic, when a lot of Vermont schools really took advantage of that, at, I believe from middle school on up. I don't know if there was any elementary work with uh, VTBLC. Uh, but Vermont schools have been partnering with VTBLC for over a dozen years. It's been around for a while, so it's not brand new. Currently, we have 15 active students taking in total 20 courses, including core courses, AP courses, and electives. Pretty cool. Virtual study is a little, it's tough, right? You have to be able to self-manage. You have to be able to provide that. But part of the work I do with those folks is support. Uh, we also have three students taking virtual study online courses with Brigham Young University. So it's not just BTVLC because there are a lot of schools out there of various kinds doing uh, virtual offerings. Our sixth branch is dual enrollment and early college. The dual enrollment is when a student takes a college course to earn college credit and to meet high school graduation requirements at the same time. Six students right now are taking seven courses through dual enrollment. Again, pretty good numbers, especially for such a small school. Early college is when a student attends college during their senior year of high school, completing their final year of public school and their first year of college at the same time. That's pretty cool and a big money saver. Right now we have two students at two different colleges doing early college. All right, our seventh branch is expanded learning. This is the state's language. I, was, I, I decided to adopt it. I was calling it smaller opportunities. I didn't like that language. So I'm going with the expanded learning. These are learning opportunities with local or regional organizations of various kinds, and ultimately perhaps with uh, more distant organizations that we could explore learning with uh, digitally, using, using the internet tools that we have. The idea here is that these smaller opportunities, these expanded learning opportunities, provide little chunks of proficiency work. And then you can combine them to create what you need to achieve proficiencies in whatever your given discipline is. Pretty, pretty cool way to do that. Um, examples might include, for instance, the Governor's Institutes, if you know about those. These are week-long academic summer camps, um, I think generally in Montpelier. And uh, when I, in previous life, when I was in other teaching, I knew students who loved them and had a really great time there. Um, that's one example. Um, there's an organization called Grow More, Waste Less, which is a food systems education and action organization. And I know the middle school, I think, and the elementary school are doing some work with them. Great folks. Uh, Bread and Puppet Theater could be an example, if you don't know them. It's a theater performance and uh, a theater that offers performance participation and internships, puppet making, behind the scenes, stage work, all kinds of cool stuff. I'd like to work with those. Also, international experience, travel and exchange student programs would fall into this category. Eighth, eighth branch up here at the top um, is independent study and proficiency completion. So this is where I have been spending, I spent a lot of time at the beginning, and I've been working uh, with students, a lot of students on that. This is managed by me, the Flexible Pathways Coordinator. 
So independent study is when a student wants to study something that we do not currently offer. So a student might want to study Russian literature and history. We don't have that. So we can build an independent study for it. Uh, for next year, we have two students on board uh, planning to do, hoping to do independent studies. Their proposals are underway. Um, my direction has been to have a design discussion uh, with students who want to do that and then get the student to write the proposal uh, with input from me. And then we'll take that proposal to the teacher of record, to the principal, get it approved, move forward. Again, student, right? Self-direction, self-advocacy. So the student takes uh, primary responsibility for that proposal. Proficiency completion, kind of go together, is when a student has not completed the proficiencies in a given course and needs another way to do that. Right now I have seven students engaged in proficiency uh, completion. Two of them are seniors. I'm hopeful that they're gonna succeed because they need it to graduate. Um, the rest are younger students whose work will probably extend into next year. So the final branch is a new idea. The final branch is research. And I get really excited about this. Before I came on here, I was thinking about this idea. When I, when I, well, before I landed here, I, would, I had been hired and I was thinking about what am I gonna do there? And research, research is a really cool idea. And I don't mean like a research paper, I'm gonna go research global warming and write an argument about it. No, I mean academic research within a discipline. So uh, colleges use this, my older child is going to college in the fall. So I've been getting all this sort of exposure to different schools. Public universities are using this as a selling point because their professors, tenured faculty, uh, do independent research, right, for their own careers. And even freshmen at these colleges can step in and join and support these professors in their research work and learn a lot about how that level of academic research works. I'd like to fold that in and do some of that work here with students who are interested in that. Um, this one could fall under independent study, but I kind of felt like it deserved its own branch because I think it could be really exciting. Um, technically, it would probably be an independent study, but it involves relationship building and other aspects. So I think uh, it gets its own, its own branch. So, yes, I know that was fast. Um, as you just saw, the branches of the Flexible Pathways tree are the pathways. Right, CBL's pathway, CTE's a pathway, independent studies a pathway. So the individual student work makes up the twigs and buds. I'm working my metaphor. Uh, makes up the twigs and buds that are on the tree. And eventually the leaves. In working directly with students this year, I've mostly been working with emergent problems, right? Proficiency completion so the student can graduate on time or can get back on track and you know stick to their four-year goal. However, as noted back in slide three, when I talked about what flexible pathways are, such student work ultimately needs to be planned. We're always going to have emergencies. You can't get away from that. It's the reality of life, right? Things come up. We're gonna to have to prune, graft, and otherwise heal to our trees. But the vast majority of flexible pathways work should be a matter of design, not repair. It should be planned. So in addition to the pathways that I've explained in the previous slide, all the other pathways, I've been developing with students independent studies and proficiency completion to address requirements at various grade levels. Some of the work that started as proficiency completion is providing structure and templates for work that will be planned for next year and beyond. So for the following slides, here we go, the following slides are a snapshot of an independent study that I started designing with a student who needed to demonstrate proficiencies that would enable him to be recognized for one English course and for US history and government, which is a graduation requirement uh, here at the high school. This is the overarching design. Four interdisciplinary projects combining work and standards from each discipline, global citizenship and uh, English, and providing multiple expl explorations of each standard required for that course because that's how a course works. If you're in the classroom, you're working on those standards and proficiencies <laughs> over and over and over again to really prove your, your mastery or your proficiency level. Um, so there were four projects. The first one was a business plan and then regulations. He was doing automotive repair business. So the regulations were, it was about environmental regulations, how they came to be, and that was working in standards from global citizenship about how the legislative process works, about the impact of laws on people, the economy, et cetera. The second project uh, would have been about military vehicular technology, the evolution of military vehicles and the history and impact of them. Third project was gonna be about the Navajo wind talkers who helped to break a lot of important codes in World War II, um, help the allies win. Um, the last project, which we're gonna look at in a little bit more detail was called Life on the Reservation. And this was storytelling and history 
of the reservation system in this country, impacts on uh, the people, et cetera. So um, the next slide presents the responsibilities of student and flexible pathways coordinator. Um, so, so there were four kind of responsibilities for the student, complete four interdisciplinary projects, that was about mastery of proficiencies, learn and practice skills within each of those, multiple attempts at each standard, negotiate projects and assessments with the flexible pathways coordinator. Again, the idea is that the student does some, has input, right, in the growth of these projects. And finally, meet with the flexible pathways coordinator periodically for various purposes, instruction, conferences, timing, academic support, whatever they need. The flexible pathways coordinator responsibilities were to initiate the design of the work and the timelines with the student, to negotiate and meet with the student according to student responsibilities, that was another part of the academic contract, which I didn't want to bore you with, to provide lessons and academic and time management support as necessary for the student's understanding and growth, to provide ongoing feedback on all work related to each project, and finally, to engage with relevant teachers and administrators to ensure proper documentation for the independent study. That one deserves a little explanation. So when I say relevant teachers, the idea is that, actually, according to the state, the law is that you have to have teach a teacher of record to sign off on any work that a student does under flexible pathways. So if I'm doing social studies work with a student, I don't have a social studies license. I don't have that endorsement, an English endorsement. So I could do the English part, and I could be the teacher of record, but I would have needed a social studies teacher to come in and say, yes, this is valid work. My idea would be that we will have done the feedback. I would have come with a relatively finished product and a recommendation for that teacher. And the teacher would say, yes, no, do a little more, and then I'll say yes. Um, would give their own feedback. The part with administrators would be to connect with the principal, make sure all along the way that they know what's going on, get their approval at various stages. And then the other part would be, and not that the school counselor is an administrator, but fit in that category, sort of, to ensure with Ms. Lamoth, Mrs. Lamoth, that um, all the records, she knows enough to maintain the records, which is really, that's her job, right? To keep the transcript and the grade report cards and everything straight in our software. So all these things, oh, sorry, I'm jumping the gun. Finally, <laughs> here is a glance at the uh, standards, texts, and some of the set, I'm not gonna walk you through the whole thing. It's a lot of words, but I want to put it up there and, and I'll do a brief. Um, it's a glance at the standards and the text. So they would have explored those multiple attempts, remember, of each standard, they would have explored six global citizenship standards through this one project, four English language arts standards through this one project. There would have been one, two, three, four visual texts, movies, TV shows, and there would have been multiple uh, written texts of various length, fiction and literature, as well as nonfiction, primary documents about how it came to be, what were the legislative actions, what were the policies that created the reservation system, and then what was life like and what is life like on the reservation? Again, primary documents, people live there, writing about it and getting us to understand what they're going through. Using all of that, right, using all of that text, all those texts, all those explorations of knowledge and information, they would create, the student would create two summative assessments. Both of these could involve research or would involve research. Both could mix in uh, some writing with video, audio, presentation, right? If you're doing a video, you gotta have a script, so that's writing, right? So you can get at those proficiencies, those standards in different ways. The first one was for ELA, synthesis essay. Veracity, authenticity, fiction versus real life. Does it accurately, do these fictional representations accurately uh, show what the student learned about from the realistic uh, presentations, from the primary documents? And then there would be an informative or argumentative essay, which would address and explain the creation of the problem, how did it come to be, and what problems resulted from the reservation system the contributions of native peoples despite this adversity, and that's another specific standard in the global citizenship uh, department. And finally, the argumentative part would be, how do we address these problems? How do we right these wrongs that were perpetrated through these policies? So if you take all of these together, the last three or four slides, they combine to show the level of rigor and complexity in this standard, in this pathway, excuse me. This sort of planning can, of course, be scaffolded, right, according to student need. Not every student who, if, if I reuse this with another student, the next student might not do as much of that. They might not be ready to do as much, but they'd get the depth regardless. They'd get the breadth of those things, and they'd get a level of depth 
to match what they might get in the classroom. Just like in the classroom, we make accommodations and we make modifications for students who need them. Flexible like pathways do honor that as well, all of those special ed requirements and related um, adjustments. Um, projects are customizable, adaptable, and scalable. By definition, they are tailored to individual student interests while satisfying the school's proficiencies and academic expectations. Parker, thank you. <laughs> um, so that one was the most developed independent study I'd have, but I wanted to give you a shot. That one's really ambitious and I think pretty meaningful. Here are some that are in development, um, just briefly. So I called this one movement and mentoring. It's a physical education independent study. And so this would meet uh, a requirement, right? This one's called Nature and Snaps. It combines art and English. It's a photography and writing project. And again, there's a quick shot of how many standards get uh, worked on. This one's called The Archer at Work and Play, which addresses one physics standard. So it's a small piece of some science requirements and five physical education standards. This one's called Seeing the World, which combines art with global citizenship. And again, a combination of visual arts standards and global citizenship standards. Some of these you can see are full independent studies, effectively, and some of them are going to be expanded learning opportunities. You might know too, I did that very quickly, but you might have noted that three out of four of them are interdisciplinary, right? And that's by design. It is our goal to deepen interdisciplinary work, to increase meaning for students by helping them find connections, not only from their interests to their schooling, but among different disciplines in that educational experience. That's important, right? Because learning outside of school is seldom restricted to a single area of study. Even if it's a training for something, there's still multiple things that you're thinking about and working on when doing that. So, if flexible pathways are a tree, then the coordinator is the dendrologist and chief arborist. I'm working my metaphor. It is my job to study the trees, both trees, to understand the trees and take care of them, enabling students to climb where they will and where they must. Right now, and this, this is the slide about what I've been doing since I've been here, right now I'm working with 28 students in various capacities, including proficiency completion, independent study, virtual study, and academic counseling. That last one isn't a pathway all by itself, but it does help students to understand the trees. This does not include students working in CBL, CTE, and the PLC, because uh, the Flexible Pathways Coordinator mostly does not work directly with those students. They're in programs that exist and are led by other people. But the ultimate goal is to bring all the branches together under the care of the dendrologist, um, except for the PLC and CBL and CTE again, um, which branches are tended by professionals hired for that purpose. So we do talk about CTE. I would, Nicole, uh, Mrs. Lamoth right now is maintaining that and doing those contacts with our people there and organizing those. And I'm gonna take that into Flexible Pathways work so we can free up Mrs. Lamoff to do school counselor work. She's, uh, she does a lot here and uh, it's time to share the wealth and share the tasks. So my work um, this year has so far fallen into two categories, direct service and concrete tasks and working toward the future. Um, and, and very little of this is done alone, by the way. This is definitely a, a position that relies on and feeds into and away from lots of different people and, and uh, departments. Um, with the counselor, I've been dealing with sort of emergent student concerns, academic crises, as mentioned earlier. I've been providing academic counseling, organization, time management, communication, sometimes academic skills. I worked on uh, PLP design and implementation, taking the system that we had last year and starting to retool it a little bit uh, for purposes here. And with uh, Mrs. Lamoth and another teacher, we were doing the ninth grade planning and implementation, collaboration with them. And I was also planning and collaboratively working with uh, Mr. McCracken and another teacher for involvement in the 10th to 12th grade field piece. Um, finally, I recently, maybe three weeks ago, assumed oversight of the BTVLC work. Uh, that means counseling students on course selection, supporting them with time management skills and communication, serving as primary contact between the high school and BTVLC. And uh, again, the school counselor remains in charge of records and transcripts. So that is her job. Uh, my other category of work has been working toward the future. So the first thing I had to do was build knowledge, not having been here before, uh, not knowing enough about CTE programs and other things that go on here. So I had to spend some time doing that. Good deal of learning, starting with the workings and culture of this school, um, but then moving into knowledge of CTE and 
other branches. I've been building relationships and finding collaborations with colleagues. Um, as you can imagine, the Flexible Pathways Coordinator has to work with everyone, um, admin, teachers, counselors, nurse, front office staff, paraeducators, oh yeah, students. <laughs> so, you know, that's in there somewhere. Um, specifically, Nicole Lamoff and I have been building a deep collaborative relationship uh, because our functions are integrally connected. We, we need to have a real team there between the counselor and a Flexible Pathways Coordinator. And we've been very, very successful in that. We're good support to each other. Um, also, teacher support and administrative support, you know, it's just a matter of a, a school of this size and a staff of this size. Sometimes it feels like there are no restrictions on duties. We just help each other out in every way we can and, and in the moment. And that can be very small things or, or much more supportive, bigger things. I have also been engaging in self-designed and online professional development, um, really figuring out this role and what it is. Uh, it's exciting to be able to build it, but there are also existing things I needed to know more about, so I've been doing that. Um, exploring lots of different reading materials, looking at other school-based programs, uh, looking at potential partner organizations, just doing some self-guided research to figure out what we can really do here uh, with this department. Um, finally, I've been working on vision, um, both on my own and with various teams. I've met with two uh, SU teams, exploring proficiency-based education and flexible pathways, and I've begun a capacity building and design relationship with Jeannie Phillips at the Terran Institute who was already working with the middle school. So they kind of folded me into to that uh, arrangement. That latter work, among other things, with Jeannie Phillips is going to lead to a pretty major overhaul of the personalized learning plan uh, system. All of this, all of this and everything that came before feeds directly the development of the Flexible Pathways Department that uh, Superintendent Canardi wants and that I believe, we believe that the SU needs. So speaking of which SU needs, this work has exposed some SU-wide needs. First, systemic needs. We need proficiency clarity. How is PBE going to work in this supervisory union? We're on the way, but it needs to be fully developed. We're not there. This is not my work. It's not the work of the Flexible Pathways Coordinator or the department, but it is necessary that we do the work for Flexible Pathways to function successfully, never mind, for, I would say, for the school to function in the way that we want it to do. Um, we have exposed uh, needs in our students, right? And this goes back to the K-8 soil. For flexible pathways to work, for deep learning to occur in high school on either tree, our students need to arrive with curiosity, follow through, and the capacity for self-direction. Still evolving, of course, but they need to have some of all of those things already present. We need to foster executive function K-8. This is not, again, precisely the work of the Flexible Pathways Coordinator, but these traits will be further developed through our personalized learning plans, and we need those, again, those foundation of those skills and those traits in order to have this work and in order for school children uh, to succeed in, on both trees. Um, finally, uh, needs from our faculty and for our faculty. Uh, I need teams, and we need time for that, and that takes us to our final slide. So if the Flexible Pathways uh, Coordinator is the chief arborist, then that means that the faculty are faculty farmers. So I get to facilitate that work. Um, as of the middle of next week, I will have met with probably, I'm gonna say three quarters or 80% um, of the faculty to formally share and discuss the vision for Flexible Pathways as well as teacher engagement. What this means in the immediate term or the near term is the building of two teams of teachers based in teachers and me. Uh, team one is focused on the validity and rigor of flexible pathways programming. Flexible pathways must be rigorous. They must be as intellectually or academically challenging as any work you can encounter in the regular classroom. So what does that look like, right? This team will work to answer that question to ensure that these pathways are as effective and valid as any classroom work. I want to involve students in that process. Don't know what that looks like yet. I don't even know for sure what it looks like to involve the teachers because I'm working on that next week. Um, and I do know that there will be some summer work involved here and there will be ongoing work throughout, uh, well, around, <laughs> moving forward because it's gonna be a team. And this team is gonna continue to work. Some of those flexible pathways coordinator responsibilities, when I showed you the student responsibilities and the, my responsibilities, some of those FPC responsibilities are gonna go to teachers on the team right, to working directly with that student. Um, team two is focused on the personalized learning plan. Oops, I failed to edit there, sorry. Um, we will create 
for the, the PLP, a flexible framework around exploration of proficiency-based graduation requirements and transferable skills so that each student gets to explore themselves, their interests, and their educational directions in ways that best suit them and still meet the proficiencies and academic expectations of White River Valley High School. The team will design this new system and will lead implementation across the building, providing teacher advisors with the tools and protocols to bring PLPs to life with the students. Thank you for your patience. Uh, before I take questions, are there any slides you want to go back to or any sort of bits of information you need repeated? And then we can go to deeper questions. You, you can ask too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <clears throat> As far as I'm concerned. Okay. We have one Shannon has a Whoa. hand up. <laughs> oh, Shannon. Hi, Shannon. Hi, how are you? Um, how are you envisioning um, helping get this message out to the parents and community members about what's going to be happening in the coming years with this program um, and what, uh, what opportunities their students might have? Thank you for asking that. Um, the part of the job when Jamie and I talked the first time and when I came on board was to say, I'm having a problem with where do I look? Um, so part of, the, part of the job from the beginning has been marketing and outreach. So it's not only to the community and the parents, but also to the students, right? How do I get the students to know more about this? So we're going to do a number of things. Um, this has not been because I'm focused right now on the building capacity. I haven't actually I don't have a, a uh, communication strategy in place yet, but I'm going to leverage social media. I'm going to leverage uh, morning meeting in the building, and I'm going to use sort of all the various, you know, through teachers, through CVL, through all the programming that we already have to talk to students. Um, and similarly, similarly to talk to adults. Um, we'll use the, you know, regular newsletter that goes out via email. I have a Facebook account that's going to tie to the high school's Facebook page. Ultimately, I want to work in other social media and we're working on that um, with our technology director. Um, had a meeting about that a couple weeks ago. So we'll definitely use all those ways to get out there. It's actually really essential, not only for, I mean, you and I met at the um, We Are Wildcats night, so you know, um, but we are actually also gonna be reaching out when we go to the middle school um, and any other kind of outreach we do to recruit students, that I'm gonna be part of that or the messaging of from the department is gonna be part of that. So okay. there will be a multifaceted plan. Ask me again next fall. I'll have more info for you. I'd love to also see um, some sort of short video featuring you and this program on our uh, website. Um, maybe also tied to our prospective families page. That's great. Thank you. That's a good idea. I'll, I'll, I will work on that. Excellent. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I actually have a question. Um, could you maybe elaborate just a little bit more on the adult education, like kind of maybe like an example of a pathway that someone could take for that? So adult education is a specific program. Mm -hmm. So when a student has sort of exhausted all their possibilities here and just for various reasons mm -hmm. can't succeed here, it's not working, then they have the option to pursue the state program and be able to access adult ed. It's it has uh, gates to access, and there's a battery of academic tests that students take, okay. three tests. Um, it's a it's a six point scale. They have to score a five to get into the program and a six to graduate from it. So that's the short version. Um, but they do all programming, like they do all the all the disciplines, all the things that you would encounter in school. You've got your history and English and science and math. It's all there. Um, so it's just that it's done outside of the school building, and they are not graduates of the school they are graduates of that program. Oh. So there is a there's a trade-off there. Yeah. But for some students it really does end up being the best path. Cool. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. And it was really nice. I, the metaphor. Yeah. I think you did like that already. <laughs> Man of metaphors. Any other uh, I don't know, questions, concerns? I'm around, you can always find me. Would we be able to get a copy of the presentation as well as, I know the presentation was kind of an over see of the model, but 
maybe a copy of the notes that you used for the presentation so we can go through that. Think about it a little more, yeah. yeah, a little more deeply. Um, Jamie has a copy of the presentation. Yes. Yeah, um, and I can do kind of a bulleted high points uh, sure. list and, and share that with Jamie as well. Um, I, I, probably not this week, <laughs> no, <that's laughs> but I can I can put that together. Uh, no, that's a great idea. Then you can kind of sit with it a little better. Um, my question would be kind of like, so as I assume, like as students become freshmen and, and start their term, that's when the kind of personalized learning plans are developed. And then like, what stage of the process do you wind up kind of getting pulled in? Like you're not going to be doing a PLP with every, every student, but at some point. So the personalized learning plans ultimately will be led by teacher advisors. Um, the team will create the protocols and then I will continue to be involved in kind of oversight, I guess. And ultimately, I probably all teachers will have access to all students because ultimately you pretty much come in contact with everybody. Uh, but certainly even in the beginning, they'll probably all be funneled through me so I can look at them and think about what I'm seeing, getting a sense of the student body, um, thinking about this idea of interests and tailoring things to people. Um, so in that sense, I'm involved from the beginning. Then the personalized learning plan, so the state of Vermont requires, for instance, if a student wants to take a dual enrollment course, they have to put that in their personalized learning plan. It has to be present before they can access that program. I would like to do that for all the path, for all the flexible pathways. Whatever the student wants to do, it's asserted within there and it's part of their plan. That part at the beginning about it being a planned experience. This is this has to be not reactive, but planned. Um, again, there are always emergencies, but that would be the idea. So uh, there is some discussion still, and there will continue to be discussion about when is when students are allowed, I guess, to access flexible pathways. Uh, my position is as soon as they walk through the door. Um, other people believe that it's 11th and 12th grade. We have to go through these gates first, and that's part of what the team is going to work on, and part of what uh, ultimately Mr. Thomas and, and uh, Mr. Kanani are going to have some, some say in that, I'm sure, as well. Um, so that is that is the goal, and I'm, I'm always mindful of who I'm sharing with. So as we develop these plans and these teams, I don't think we can expect administrators to attend meetings, but they'll certainly, I mean, regularly, uh, but they're certainly invited, um, and they're certainly, um, you know, shared after and asked for approval of the various things that are put in place to, to make sure that we're meeting all the kind of legal requirements and the, the vision of the, uh, you know, of the instructional leaders in our, in our world. Can I add to that, please? The, the law says 7th through 12th grade. Right. I think we believe when you're ready, like you said, right. it's not a high school program. I think the work you've done is amazing, by the way. Really appreciate it. Yep. And um, I, it's important that Ben coordinates with Absolutely. the middle school flexible pathways coordinator. <laughs> and that program needs to be brought up to speed. And this is going to help a lot. We see now where the ramp, I can see the ramp to it. So I'm pretty excited. And that is, and that is the direction. And I didn't, I didn't put an emphasis on that because we haven't gotten to that discussion yet. Don't worry. But I believe, and we've talked about it before, yeah. that this is definitely, um, the, the ultimately it becomes a 7 to 12, at least the POP part becomes 7 to 12, and Flexible Pathways becomes 7 to 12. Of course, there are different needs. As again, I think we talked about a little bit between the middle school has some somewhat different needs and high school has some somewhat different needs, but there's definitely overlap. It's a really nice Venn diagram here. Um, and there's definitely a lot of shared thinking. I think we can, I like that you said that about the, the ramp because I think we can learn from each other. Um, as long as we don't build it out of trees. My, <laughs> exactly. We don't, want to, we don't want to knock the trees down, they have to thrive. So anyway, I'm very excited to be here. I'm very excited to work with you know, all these folks and, and uh, to hear from feedback from the board um, and from the community. I mean, ultimately, as Shannon brought up, how do I get it out to the community? Well, that's that's part of it. And hopefully, if you look at that CBL program, it's astounding how involved the community has been. We can start to do that with other flexible pathways as well. Fantastic. That's that's where I want to go, right? The community engagement should be a thrust of this program. For this program. <laughs> All right, thank you. I will um, communicate with Superintendent Carney about the bullet points and uh, one edit to make on the slideshow. And uh, you have that. So hopefully in the next week or two, we can make sure we have a package for, for the board for request. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks, Thanks so for the pleasure.
Great job, Ben. Thank you. Um, Emily's raising hand. Uh, Emily, what do you have? Hi. Um, sorry, I didn't speak up during the adjustments to the agenda. I wasn't sure if I could, as a non-board member, adjust anything. And also, we were having some technical difficulties getting our GSA kids on the meeting, but I wondered if it would be possible to do that before the other, just because it is a school night and they need to get to bed, but I don't know. Um, Any dinner, probably. But maybe it's not possible, in which case I'm, they're troopers and they'll probably sit sit tight. Is everybody okay moving the, the presentation up? No, I have no problem. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. We can do that now. Awesome. So, I'd be happy to um, just give a very brief overview. The um, as a White River Valley Middle School principal and uh, somebody that believes in safety and belonging everywhere, um, I'm very supportive of the students' work in this. Um, as far as supporting students' identity and who they are becoming or who they are. And the students are going to speak to themselves and speak eloquently, I know of it. And um, they have done this work, not just recently, but they, they started it last year. So I'm going to let them take over. They have a very comprehensive presentation. So um, Ms. Miller is, or Ms. Brainerd, do you want to introduce any parts of this? Explain the essay maybe? Uh, sure. I just also realized, and L, I think you were going to do the presentation, but um, I don't appear to be able to share my slides. Oh, now it's available, so it looks like I can do that. Okay, so I can do that for you, L. The GSA, I can give you a real quick overview of who we are and what we do, um, unless Ms. Brainerd would like to jump in and, and do that. You're good to go. <laughs> okay. Um, so a GSA, just kind of like a, a general description, is a student-run organization. Uh, the goal is to unite LGBTQ plus and allied students to build community, organize around issues impacting the community and our schools and the broader community. Um, we started because there was student interest um, and we started meeting in September. Um, it got a little wonky in the winter, but we've been meeting um, on every full Friday since the beginning. It's been awesome. Um, we have a really dedicated group. It's a lot of fun, but they are really passionate about what they believe in. So happy to turn it over if you are ready, Elle. Hello, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, hello. <laughs> Okay, so a few of us from the GSA worked on this presentation for this. Um, so why the pride, pride flag should be raised at the middle school or anywhere, I guess. Um, okay, next slide, please. So why the flag is important. Raising the LGBTQ plus flag is important because in recent years, the world has begun to change. We are all learning to find ourselves and accept other groups of people. Topics about the LGBTQ plus community have been more and more common as the years go by. That means more people have more knowledge of who they connect with and find out ways to identify themselves as to how they feel comfortable with their own skin. Our middle school has a large amount of people who identify with the commu community, but some might not feel safe to be who they are. The flag would show that we are a school that will be there for our students and support them. The GSA doesn't even make up half of the students in that are in the LGBTQ plus community. Okay. <laughs> For the community. Raising the pride flag would give LGBTQ plus community students 
a sense of belonging and acceptance. We have taken a survey to understand how the student body feels about the possibility. 61% of the responses we received from our survey state that people would feel comfortable with raising with the pride flag being raised, which is the blue. 21%, 21.8% represent students who aren't necessarily against or for the flag being raised, and 16.7% people wish for the flag to stay off the pool. Next slide, please. There you okay. So this one is kind of like the final, would you be fine if it was raised? Um, so the red fraction of the circle is 73.1% for the flag being raised and the blue is all 26.9% against the flag being raised. So as shown, most of the students would like the flag to be raised or would not mind picking up. Uh, next slide, please. Many schools around the country raise pride flags during pride month. So that is, which hasn't been done until recent years. Not many people have thought about it. Um, raising the pride flag would show our support and evolution as a community for this. This would be um, our own way of responding to the anti-LGBTQ plus legislation, such as the Don't Say Gay Bill, which is not its actual name, but it is a nickname due to what the bill has in it. If the flag were to be raised, then it'd send a positive message to everybody coming to our school or driving by. It represents a welcoming community and our hope for equality. Next slide, please. So I'm obviously not gonna read all of that, but if you'd like to, you can. A summary of what it says is, schools are allowed to tell parents personal and private things, uh, private information on their kid to reinforce fundamental right of parents to make decisions regarding upbringing and control of their children. It takes away the ability in school to make or adopt procedures or student support forms that don't allow people to share what was said or, or groups that encourage a kid not to share with, with and involve their parents. This applies to the to things like mental, emotional, and physical health. It also does not allow classroom discussions about sexual orientation or gender identity in the certain grade in certain grade levels, which is why this bill is known as the Don't Say Gay Bill, which this isn't some gruesome or violent topic. It's it's not harming anybody to learn about this. So, yeah, um, next slide, please. So some examples of the pride flags being raised are um, Wisconsin State Capitol building for Pride Month. The progression pride flag flies at Huntsville Public School and Toronto Catholic District School. And OK, uh, next slide, please. So. Why is this important to the LGBTQ community? The sexualities and gender identities of LGBTQ plus community of the LGBTQ plus community are being used as insults. So I've personally walked through my school hallway and heard people say things like, like, that's so gay or "Ew, I'm not a lesbian. And who we are shouldn't be used derogatory. Um, Members of the community feel unrepresented. Uh, like when it comes to television, very few things have LGBTQ plus representation. Communities, uh, <laughs> companies like Disney try to change the gender of a character just to make the relationship straight. Like uh, Amity Blight from The Owl House, a kid's cartoon. Some, some members have nowhere to express their true self because no one has let them know it's okay and there is a safe space. No one has ever like told them that so they don't feel like they can share that. We as a community and school need to be open to change 
um, change doesn't stop because you are not like, used to it. Um, like, it may take time to get used to it, but it's something that you will eventually have to do. Um, and I, a few weeks before, not even a few weeks, like a week before writing this um, slide, I had read in the news that there was a killing of a trans woman in Vermont, which um, people are like dying because they're gay, trans, etc. People are dying because of something that they cannot control. You don't choose to be gay. You can't decide these things. And to lose your life because of that is ridiculous. <laughs> Um, that's it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions for the students at this time? Do we need a motion to uh, act on this? Is it hand raised? Right, well, it's a general discussion. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, we're just having some discussion first. Go ahead, Shana. You're muted. Ella, thank you so much for speaking. I know it's not easy to come and speak in front of this many adults, so I really respect that you came and spoke to us so eloquently. Um, what is it that you're asking of us? Um, we were hoping that we could raise the pride flag at um, I guess, for, like, we were thinking the middle school campus, but, like, if both campuses were done, that'd be great, um, to raise the progression pride flag. Yeah. Well, I'd make a motion to, to, to let the principals do that at both sides. I mean, I, I would wait on a motion until we have further discussion. I mean, that would be, you, you can make a motion, to, but we can have further discussion. You can't have a discussion until you have a motion on the floor. No, we can have discussion anytime. You don't have to have a motion to have no discussion. Yeah, but I think we're okay having it either way. Like, if you want to make a motion, then we have a discussion, that's fine, or we can have discussion and make a motion. Um, Did you have something you wanted to? Oh, I, I, so I think, uh, um, yeah, I have, I have something, but just to clarify, so it sounds like that the, um, what you're asking for is, is to be able to fly the flag for the month of June. Does that sound correct? Uh, we were hoping like the whole year, but if like a compromise has to be made, we are willing to like do that. And then there's it, um, and then we, yeah, there's a lot of details, but like for instance, you know, it's actually against the law to fly another flag on the United States um, flag um, pole. So you technically would have to have a different flag pole to do that. I know other places do that, but technically it's against the law to do that. Um, but I, I guess what I wanted to say was, you know, thank you, you know, Emily and, and Lindley and Ella and Brianna, Nula. Um, I think those are all the names that I captured. Um, if there's anybody else in there, I can't see you because you're not in the 12 box square. But uh, definitely, you know, thank you for coming. And, you know, I appreciate the conversation. And, and you know, it seems that you're very passionate, obviously, on the topic. And yeah, it's good to hear. Um, you know, and I, I'm a new board member. So, um, you know, I had to kind of do a little research just to find, you know, uh, well, one that currently our school system doesn't have a policy in regards to flags or banners, as Jamie had noted in our um, packets. Um, do we, and, and again, this is a new thing, do we, do we have a student council? Has this been a topic that's gone to the student council maybe, or? Uh, we did not know about this until this meeting. Because, you know, a lot of times, just chain of command, you know, mm -hmm. usually things go through the student council on something like this. Um, but I, I did want to, you know, doing some research, you know, um, to date, our school system is what I would say has taken a neutral posture on on topics such as this one um, that's 
been presented this evening, you know, and I think we can all agree here as um, I, I reached out for some information is, you know, the current neutrality of the school's position has made it successful, successful for all students to represent their First Amendment rights on all sorts of topics. Um, that is definitely something that we should celebrate and feel proud about um, that that all individuals in our school seem open to um, to talk about a wide range of topics that are dear to their heart. So, you know, I definitely, uh, that's something for us to celebrate. And, and the challenge that we have as a board and other individuals that may not be here or on the screen that are board members understand that sometimes the decision isn't as easy as deciding on the topic at hand rather than the formality in the press as a result of the um, uh, at the answer to the question. So, you know, and how does that affect not only past and present, but also future considerations of any topic? Because um, when we're talking about First Amendment rights, that's First Amendment rights of any topic, not just certain topics. So we just have to make sure that we understand that. I think it's a very abnormal um, uh, topic and um, but we have to think of you know including everybody into this decision so I don't I guess that's kind of where I want to leave it yeah I mean I, I don't know that this is a first amendment thing since this is the school itself deciding whether to raise a flag or not you know the students being able to speak about it will be kind of the first department maybe not the students but you know anyway so anyway I, I agree that we need to consider kind of the like we're not just approving this flag we're approving flags in general for you know this kind of expression and it, right now it's for the pride flag but we need to consider other flags as well whether we're comfortable with that in general um i mean my my general feeling is that i'm fine with empowering the administration to make a decision about this and letting them decide what is an, is an appropriate um, as we go up. But I'm open to you know, hearing other people's views on it. Well, I agree with Andrew's position on it. I would empower the administration to decide. Uh, personally, for me, uh, I'm fine with that flag going up and following whatever you know, it does lead us to think about future uh, at requests for other types of display, such displays. We're going to have to think about that down the road, but uh, uh, I would support it. Let the administration, make, uh, you know, with our support, support our community. And uh, you know, these, everybody's part of the community and have a right to express themselves. And, this is a form of expression that they're entitled to as far as I'm concerned. But I think we have to also understand that the decision is solely <clears throat> with the board, not the administration. So because there is no policy, administrators follow policies. Because there isn't a policy currently drafted, and this is wholly a board decision. We have to also understand that there is no consideration for other individuals as you have to be equal. So if we, and this is where it's challenging because it's a great cause, but we have to also think that if somebody else presents something to us, we can't think about it. You know, at that point, you have to act the same way equally as we did with another identity or another group. I, I disagree. I don't think you have to act the same way. I think that it's, it's about, this is about supporting our students and there's nothing about the pride flag that's about hate speech. Um, and I think there are some flags out there that I would say are about supporting that. And I also think that um, I wanna say thank you to Lindley and, and Emily um, for the work that you've done. A lot of these kids, like Ella said, don't have an adult in their lives that they feel like they can be open with, don't have an adult that, um, they feel like they can come out to necessarily. And we know that those kids are at a super high risk for things like suicide. And so I think making a statement and saying, yes, 
We support our students. We are a safe space to talk about this, to be who you are is a really important message. Um, and I would absolutely, <laughs> I would support flying this flag year round. I think probably most reasonably, it should be flown at least in June um, for Pride Month, but um, I don't think this necessarily opens us up to having to allow any flag that wants to be flown to be flown. Can I, can I weigh in? So I, I reached out to our legal counsel on this because we don't have a policy um, and they're still doing some research around challenges that have been made across the state in regards to what you're discussing right now around First Amendment rights and flying the flags. Um, and so I, I'm, I spoke to her literally twice this week, 30 minutes before the board meeting. And so her recommendation was that the board was in support of this, that we acknowledge that the board is in support of it, um, and that the board could do one of two things. They could have a special meeting to actually take action. Um, once we get clarity from council or the board could actually empower the administration to direct the administration to fly the flag upon approval of council. Um, and so those are the two options and motions that she would recommend. Um, I'd make a motion for the second option. Well, <clears throat> so I'd make your motion. Um, Bunch of hands you know, right, Peggy, you're correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, just like it seems like the board shouldn't be approving individual flags. Like it seems like we should kind of make a policy on whether we approve flags in general and then let the administration decide what is and isn't. And that's what would be in policy, but you don't have policy right now, right? Right. Um, but I mean, and like, there'd be procedure that we would spell out around concerns of hate speech and things of that nature. But we don't have, those policies exist in other districts. We just don't have one. The administration does make a lot of decisions that we don't necessarily have a mm -hmm. set out policy for them. So you know, I would think that us giving direction that we are okay with. No, that's that. why I said you can make that motion. Right. Um, and you can tighten it up, up with the idea of, you know, administration's consultation with council. And then my next step would be, since if that's the motion you guys move toward, we'd start working on policy around this, right? And we would look to have policy adopted within the next couple months. Okay. Um, Peggy, or actually, Ella, why don't you go first? Um, so I was wondering which law was talking about that you can't raise a flag on the same pole. And I don't think that, I'm not saying that like you're wrong, I would just like to know so that the GSA can look into it and like read it more in depth. And also, um, yeah, there are, I've thought of like some policy things that possibly might help. Um, yeah. Uh, Peggy, go ahead, or do you know what the- I'd have to get back. I, I definitely can get back to Ella. Or I, I can send it to you too, Ella. It's called the um, the flag code. There are rules about the U.S. flag and how it can be flown, um, but that's not necessarily. Are you able to say what you wanted to say? Hey, are you talking to me? I wasn't getting good reception. I'm moving out here in the wind, so maybe I will. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I mean, what I was going to say was, was I was, um, you know, thinking along the same lines. We should not have another flag flying on the, the same flagpole as the U.S. flag. But I would, I love the research that the girls did doing the surveys and getting the information to show, you know, how, how many people in the school feel that this flag should be flown. And perhaps we do need to have a flagpole that represents, that would be for student 
student flags where, you know, the majority of the students feel that this is a flag that should be flown. So I guess that was basically what I was going to say. Have I put in the that there are two flagpoles? Um, is that at both campuses or just the middle school? Not sure. Oh, okay. I believe no. it's at both. One of them flies the Vermont state flag and one has the U.S. flag at the middle school. So. I'm only aware of one flagpole on South Royalton's campus. <laughs> Lori just changed the flags. That's how I know that. I was in the office working and she just changed the flag. So there's one full. <laughs> Uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Sure, I have. Uh, Chairperson, I think they were asking only for the Bethel campus and they referred to the middle school, but there's a Bethel campus. I want to be clear on that. Too. Mm -hmm. The flags also that are on the front lawn are not student flags. Right. That'd be the campus or school, or school community flags. Right. And it appears from the flag code that you can only, you can never uh, display a national flag, another nation's flag on the same pole, but you can display other flags as long as the American flag is on top. Okay. Uh, I guess back to, uh, you know, Jamie's second option. I don't know how to put that. If you word it out, then I'll make it as an action at this point. So the the motion would have been the, to move that the administration consider student proposed flags per approval of school council moving forward until policy set is what I would suggest based on my conversation yeah, with There isn't a student council though on the middle school campus. So that's not- Say student council. Legal council. Legal, legal council. council. A legal council. So that's the motion I'll make. Okay, um, is there any second? Can I just clarify that? Was there that a motion to move the administration to consider student proposed flags per approval of school council? Um, legal counsel moving forward until policy is developed? Yep. Yes. Okay. okay thank you. I'll see. Just repeat the beginning of that. that. What word did you say? Move to do what for um, the administration? A person, whoever it is, is motioning to move that the administration consider student proposed flags per approval of legal counsel moving forward until policy is developed or established. <laughs> Right, that worked. Tammy, I made that motion, as John Olmstead. Thanks, John. Sorry, I, um, I was so focused on the words. <laughs> and uh, Shannon, do you second that? I do. Um, is there any further discussion we want to have on, anybody wants to have on the motion on the floor? Okay, then uh, let's vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Hi. <laughs> Any opposed? I'm going to vote no, but, and, and, and again, it, no with comment, because people need to understand that sometimes things are about formality and not the topic at hand. So this has nothing to do with the subject matter. And I think Lindley knows me very well. So I'm all about the formal system and how that is affected. And I would say until a formal policy is adopted that we can allow equal opportunity to flags being flying, regardless of definition, you know, I would wait for that. So that would be my no. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Chen. Um so I just also want to say thank you again, Emily, Lindley, Ella, everybody who's here. 
can you guys keep bringing us things? Because it's nice to see you. <laughs> so if you have things that come up through, you know, chain of command and go up through the principal and Jamie, we love to see you. And love to see the student representation. It's great. Thank you all for giving our kids a chance to um, speak. That's great. Yeah, thank you for your time. Thanks. Okay, so the motion's approved. Um, we'll move on to the reports to the board. Uh, so you have my um, superintendent report in hand, and um, the and I oh thank you again to the students uh, for coming and. Uh, Mr. Boynton for presenting as well. Um, so a couple uh, legislative bills that I wanna highlight for the board and for those of you on the full board, you hear me say it again next week. Um, and I also wanna put a plug in for the board members. We will have a board training series next Monday as well. We will video record it and push it out um, with Mr. Gore. Uh, so uh, the first one is there was a bill passed around unified districts that spelt out uh, a more precise uh, method for the decoupling of a district, um, which results in a study committee now um, that has to go in front of the state boards before uh, district towns would take a vote, uh, before it was a petition, um, and then a vote would happen. And it kind of, it would go back to the select board and then the school district would work with the select board to try to get factual information out and. I feel like I became an expert in that model because I've had a few decoupling votes here in the last two years. Um, and um, now this gives a, a much more uh, specific uh, policy method for how that occurs. Now, knock on wood, I feel like we've done a really good job of coming together as a district around that we're Wildcats and folks are seeing that identity. Um, and so I, and I hope in my other districts that folks are feeling um, better about the promise of the merger. Um, and see a pathway forward. So hopefully we don't have to go through that policy, but at least there is really a spelled out means now uh, for a decoupling. The other thing is the waiting um, study awaits the governor's signature. That is gonna significantly change um, how educational taxes work here into the future after next year. Um, and so right now we've been working off equalized pupils for quite some time now. And now it's gonna be a long-term waiting factor that occurs through ADM. And what it does is it actually takes into weight um, square footage, um, actual demographic and population in each town versus, uh, and it increases the weight for students if you're a town that has a certain um, low rural, they consider it rural type town with um, less population density within a certain square footage. And I don't remember what that square footage is off the top of my mind right now, so I apologize. But the other thing it wait, takes a weight in is those students service via uh, ESL, English as a second language. Um, it takes into account free and reduced lunch rates. Um, and it still does take into account middle and high school students. As you know, equalized pupils always weigh those more. The idea being that it costs more to educate um, a student in middle or high school. Um, and then it also looks at school, en school enrollment. And um, I did chuckle a little bit. There's almost a flavor of uh, phantom students in it again a little bit because those schools that are considered small schools in less than 100, those students actually count more um, within the waiting study model. But at the end to summarize, um, and we're still waiting from Brad James, what it was going to be is a positive result on the tax um, impacts for the district of Rudd. Um, in most of our districts um, within the WRBSU. And the idea is, uh, it was around the idea of rural districts having uh, more equity in regards to the idea when you think way back to Act 60 and being able to, to serve those students in rural, impoverished communities. Uh, and so I do think there's been a great deal of work done with that committee. Um, UVM did a, a bunch of study on this those communities that are actually going to result in um, higher tax uh, base increases based on the change of the waiting study uh, model, it, that won't actually take a full effect until five years from now. Um, and so that bill, we do expect to be signed into law. 
I expect the unified district bill to be signed into law. Um, the universal meals bill, um, I think that that's still a bit of a wait and see from the governor's office. Um, and I say that because the, that bill uses one time ed fund surplus money to pay for free uh, meals for students in Vermont next year. What it doesn't do though, is have a sustainable method of payment moving forward. So I could see possibly, again, this is Jamie's opinion, right? I'm following the legislature, possibly a veto there with the hope of a compromise of funding moving forward. Um, the bill does require that the legislator take up a study committee on how we would fund that moving forward. Um, so that may be enough to get a governor's signature. I will tell you, it's one that I'm following closely. I think universal meals are important for um, a lot of our students. I really worry though about where that cost falls. Um, and on, whether it's on local districts or whether it's gonna be across the state. Um, and so that's one that the Vermont superintendents have followed really closely. And then the other one um, is of course, they did look to repair the teacher retirement in uh, Vermont employee municipal retirement system. Um, they did put a, kind of a, a stop gap on that again long-term funding of how to prop that up. I still think there's some more work to be done there. Um, that was vetoed and then um, there was a, an override from the legislature on that bill. Um, and so, and then also the last thing was uh, the block grant for special education funding is occurring. Um, there has been a delay in one little piece of that bill for educators, it's not a little piece, it's it's the change to adverse effect of how a student may qualify for an IEP. There's some significant changes in how schools need to document the level of interventions and supports they put in place for a student before a school could demonstrate adverse effect. Um, as we continue to beef up our system of supports, I'm feeling more and more um, confident that we're going to have those data models in place. You hear a talk about data a lot, that's gonna be important when a team looks at adverse effect. A student does not uh, receive uh, an IEP just due to a disability, right? There has to be, um, the educational team has to then be able to demonstrate how that disability adversely affects um, that student's ability to learn and achieve. And so, that model um, is gonna change significantly. And I would say it changes significantly because now with the block funding grants, we're allowed to use resources that used to just be geared towards students with IEPs, now to provide general interventions and supports for students who need them. So funding is not just tied to IEPs now, it's tied to try to do more earlier interventions and supports as well. Um, and so they're saying, if we're going to do that, then we need to make certain that you're really showing us that you're using the funds to do that work. Um, and so that is, um, that one piece was delayed for one more year. We are moving forward to look to implement that sooner rather than later. Philosophically within our MTSS system, we believe that that's best practice. And I'll take any questions, folks. Have. I, and I, I think I brought it up there before, but uh, you were talking about, well, the transition that our, our district went through um, with our neighboring town and our towns. And have, have we gone back to do any type of assessment on, on how that transition, you know, both at the student level, at the, you know, teacher, academic level, town level, how, how that transition has gone? You know, uh, like I know one challenge, you know, being a parent of two children that just went, you know, took the jump from fifth to sixth grade, that, you know, there, there were, are and continue to be challenges on that, that jump. Um, you know, some of them are, you know, maturity level and, um, you know, some academic changes. Um, others is, you know, sports related and, you know, having, 30 kids on one team and you know so there's there's been some challenges so I just wonder if have we done any 
uh, internal assessments on how how this has gone now that we have three four years under our belt so the the administration puts out some surveys to families um, that tend to be aligned to positive behavior interventions that supports their their surveys that come to us um, and positive behavior interventions supports kind of the University of Oregon um, and so these are surveys around school climate and quality Onda Adams has been working uh, my chief academic officer has been working with the Newton school to pilot a different type of family um, survey around how folks are feeling the school experience is. We piloted that this spring. We're just getting that data back. And her plan is to then be working with the admin team to see, all right, based on the type of data we're getting from PBIS in this other survey that was a little more comprehensive, um, are we going to look to to go in a different direction? My sense is yes. Um, that we're going to have our own homemade survey um, that tries to get the root of some of that work. But I would say to you, Chris, is I think we're still in a, in a place as an organization that we're trying to come out of reactionary mode, right? And so what I mean by that is we've been reacting to COVID. We've been reacting to trying to get ourselves on stable financial ground. And we've been reacting still to mergers that didn't even see a vision for the promise of Act 46. And so I think we've now got folks seeing that there is a vision and a, and a movement forward. So now I think we can get back to saying, all right, now that there's a vision and movement forward, where are we missing still? Where are the gaps? Um, I think you gave some good examples, right, around how our transi transition's happening. I also think within this district, we got to look at it and say, is the merger exactly the way we want it, right? Or are there still places where we could see better outcomes for kids academically and possibly more efficiency, right? Like in my other districts, I think that, you know, what folks were looking at within Act 46 and these mergers was better outcomes for kids, more opportunities for kids and more efficiency. And those are, to me, those are the metrics we gotta be using, right? Are we seeing that? More opportunities, better outcomes and a more efficient, stabilized uh, financial plan as we move forward. And there's a bunch of the, uh, the SU board will be getting a new strategic plan for a five year plan this fall and the communities will to give feedback on And the strategic plan will look at curriculum instruction assessment. It will look at um, building maintenance and facilities action planning for each district like you're talking about. And it'll look at a sustainable financial pathway forward so that the tax rates are as predictable as we can try to make them. Um, knowing right now still that the yield does a lot in regards to adjusting our tax rates. Um, and so looking at what we can control, how do we make certain that it's predictable so we don't have these highs and lows in regards to tax rates for folks? Yeah, I do think um, it would be a good idea just to kind of think about some of the general you know, like when we went into the merger, we you know came up with a busing plan and stuff like that. And kind of looking at it now that we've kind of had it for a few years, reviewing some of those steps would, would be a good thing to do. Um, right. And I know some of that is being done with the sports situation. Yeah. <clears throat> and just like Jamie said, sometimes you envision something, but your your end product is slightly different than what you envision. So is it yeah. is it time to make some subtle improvements here and there? Sure. I mean, I think. Yeah, having kind of a continual improvement plan just in general, like that is where we want to be generally as a school. But I think kind of looking back at some of the overall structure of things is worthwhile. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, to be candid, right? I've asked the administration, why do we have two elementary schools? And I'm trying to put a like, this is not meant to get a bunch of people worried or, <laughs> or worked up about that, but. I do think within the merger, it's it like strategically something that we should talk about. Um, meaning in regards to just like the why. And I think that, that that's a big question, right? But I think in general, it's something that is a district that should be talked about. So I would let you know the administration's thinking exactly the way you're thinking too. Um, and again, I don't say that to get a bunch of people upset. The superintendent didn't just say that we need to have one elementary, but it's certainly at times something that, you know, I've said, how did we get there, right? And and what, why was that the pathway? Sure. Yeah, I, I don't see any 
harm with, you know, self-reflection and always throwing things against the wall to see, you know, how does it look, you know, big deal. Doesn't mean we have to do it, but. Ken. Yeah, I think what I'm hearing Jamie say is we need to be able to justify why we have two elementary schools and continue to justify why why we have some of the program we have. So yeah, I agree. Well, I mean, I think that it's that kind of assessment should take place every year anyway. I mean, not just, you know, okay, we're three, four years in, let's see what we're doing well and let's see what's not working and change it. Why don't you, why don't we think about that assessment every year? Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any other questions for Jamie? Um, we'll move on to the principals. Okay, good evening. Um, we, you received our report and there's a lot in it. But today, tonight, we're gonna talk about our social emotional data. I'm also concerned that the report was embedded in our report and so I don't think that you've got a print out of the report. I'm thinking of that right now. Oh, in the packet, no, because of the hyperlink. But we get it here. Okay. And they would they could have <laughs> but we yeah, right. get the report. And I can get email yeah, you just the slides. So we usually start uh chronologically by um early grades. Yeah, so I think that we're supposed to really focus on the behavioral data. We highlighted some other things because there's a couple things going on around here. So if you have questions about anything in the general report, uh, we're happy to go over that. Uh, we recently, I feel like this has been a good system. We have gotten into uh, the practice of kind of putting this together, presenting it to staff and going over our data, um, having them look at the trends and talk about, um, and it's linked in here, so you'll be able to see, I notice I wonder on a jam board and then talk about kind of goal setting and what the next steps are. So uh, we do a virtual meeting, so everyone's together, and then we break out into elementary, middle and high school. So I think, when we did that and looked at the specific behavioral data for this go round, and I, I don't know that I want to go through it slide by slide, but we can. No, I think, I mean, it's up to the board. Yeah. What I've been doing with boards is having the administration really talk about what, what are they gleaning from the data and what are your next steps to addressing those areas sure. of concern? Sure. So I would say that in our specific conversations, um, we started talking about brain breaks, engaging boys specifically, if you look at the data, and I think that's across all areas. And I would say there was nothing specific K to two or three to five that was like outrageously different from our last time we looked at our data. It's, it's really the same. We know that little kids use their hands to solve problems more than their words. The older they get, the more verbal they get, and maybe it looks more like non-compliance or verbal things. Um, and so I think those were the things specific we want to talk about is, um, is that in the elementary, because we did do it all together, we didn't drill down by campus. And I think that we agree that there'd be some benefit to looking specifically at each campus to see if there is some differences. Uh, and so that will happen in our universal elementary universal meetings. In addition, I think as far as next steps, we've been talking about how this is so still not even comparable to the last time because we've had a couple kids move in and so it isn't really apples to apples it's apples to oranges um, and we know that just a few kids and different behaviors can totally change the picture of some of our data so I know it was already mentioned but we had teachers do a couple surveys um, to talk about how we're adhering to like our PBS standards and their buy-in and then we had the community do the um, the climate survey. And so I think our real next step is to take this data and the data from those three surveys and create our action plan for last for next year, which I would say the last two years we haven't had time to do because we've been creating COVID response protocols. So um, I, I highlighted it in our principal's report. I mean, this we have had people go to an in-person conference, which <laughs> I know doesn't sound amazing, but our PBS coordinators haven't been able to go in person, so that they just came back like excited and regenerated and ready to rock and roll. So I don't know if you I'm ready to take or it. Reed want to talk about that. Yeah, I data. do. And uh, I'll first build on your piece about you know Shane Oaks, who's one of our folks that helps a lot with behavior. I asked him how was the conference, and he said it was really nice to see people. It was that Lake Mart, and we're doing really well from what we 
can figure out, right? So we have been in a COVID situation where we're not out there talking as much to each other in schools, out of, out of different school districts. So that was good. Um, in the middle school, uh, we the last time we measured, we part of the year we were in isolation pods. So we have three times as much behavior reporting this year as last year. That's one in, thing that we know is real. There's also been a push to have faculty really understand and document what's happening so we can have clear data. We do see, like Andra, and I know like Reed, boys are much higher than girls in bad behavior choice, and we need to get on top of that. And Jimmy, you've talked about that before when you came in schools that you've been in. It's, it's the thing, one of the major things to look at. The other thing, this Jamboard that Andra mentioned is a, is a way that faculty in a meeting, especially virtually, can say things, and it goes up like post-its. You'll see it when you look at it. And it's really, it's good for us to read, and it's important. And I, I also want to just be clear that there's three teams. There's a universal team. There's a targeted team for kids that are in tier two leveling. And there's an intensive team for kids that are at the top of the pyramid. So we have three of those teams that meet. We also have a leadership team that looks at this data before we give it to faculty and their faculty members. And they're giving us some feedback. So this has been tuned and tuned and tuned. And we're living in this data. And it's... I can't believe I'm saying this. It's really helpful. It's really lovely to have all that information so you can build the right bridges to success. Middle school, I'll tell you that the thing that I saw and that I've shared directly with faculty is it's all the soft spots where the biggest problems are. Break, which is recess for middle school. Lunch, before and after those two things. It's too loose, hallway behavior comes into the classroom. So we're aware of that and we're gonna address that this summer with the larger team. So I would hand it to Reed. Thanks, Owen. Uh, it is great to be able to look at this data and compare it to our last data report. Uh, and, and certainly at mid-year when we looked at this, uh, the number of behavior referrals in the high school was, was very concerning. Um, but uh, if you, you look at that last slide, which compares our monthly uh, numbers of referrals, it's been trending down since then. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be able to report that. Uh, I think uh, the general climate in the high school is perhaps a little bit uh, less chaotic than it was when we first came back to, to in-person learning five days a week with all 100% of our student body. Um, and, you know, minimal COVID restrictions. Uh, so I'm feeling good about that. Uh, and the data uh, supports that the actions we took in, you know, at the end of the first semester made a difference. Uh, and that was uh, generally also the anecdotal reporting of staff when they looked at the data, that after we saw that the, the number one source of behavior referrals related to uh, technology infractions, specifically inappropriate use of cell phones as distractions in classrooms, we revisited our practices. We tightened up uh, our alignment around how uh, how teachers were enforcing uh, the rules in our handbook and kind of classroom rules around the use of technology. Uh, and we've seen a decline in that. So it, it just goes to show that being able to use the data to really focus on some problem areas and intentional uh, actions uh, can make a difference in, in improving what we're seeing in the classroom. Um, you know, our, our review of this data recently brought a lot of great ideas together because uh, if you if you look behind the data, you'll see that uh, really a, a small number of students make up a disproportionate percentage of the behavior referrals. Um, and, you know, one of the challenges is how do teachers work together as a team around a specific uh, student or students problem behaviors from class to class. Um, and so the I ideas that the faculty generated were to, to spend some time next fall looking at, at this data and looking at some specific students and maybe getting the teachers of that student in a room together to look at the behavior data and talk about how does the group of teachers work as a team 
to modify behavior uh, and look at what are the antecedents of behavior uh, and what can we do to uh, to remedy some of the problems that are affecting all teachers or, or maybe one or two teachers have figured it out and it's not a problem in their classes and, and it gives us a reason to look at well what's happening in this class or this class that might be causing the behavior so uh, we, we came away with uh, five really good ideas we'll, we'll hand off to Jeff uh, and the rest of our MTSS team to take a look at uh, in faculty time next year uh, that I think will make a difference in improving our numbers and with that I I would uh, Take this one chance since I've got the floor to thank all of you for coming into the SU in the last week to sign diplomas for next month. Uh, we were surprised to, to hear that that's all set. So thank you for doing that. Questions? Yeah, yeah I was going to ask if you had questions. Comments? Do you need a motion to approve the reports? <clears throat> Think, Sorry, I uh, haven't gone to the SU. How, we're supposed to be signing the diplomas now? Uh, yeah, so the diplomas are up in the central office to be okay. signed by everyone. Yeah. Uh, I got the message that they were signed, but maybe they're not. So. I think maybe it was the message was that it was signed by me. Oh. <laughs> okay, I was just making her head too. I'm like, I'm so confused. All right. <laughs> like, well, that's that works better for the board. I'm happy to, to have those out for you. Um, there's a special pen that I signed it with. Well, I guess special. I'd like it to all be in the same ink, um, if possible. And they are um, with Christy. So if that's easier, if the school's easier, we can have it located at a school. I'm thinking, Reed, that she was letting you know I had signed them. I signed okay. them yesterday. <laughs> I love you all. This communication. <laughs> Well, I was like, boy, I just signed them yesterday. There was no signatures on them, so you guys were quick. <laughs> well, a good well, reminder that this is one of the things we have to do at the end of every year is to, to get that paperwork done so we're ready to go on June 18th. And you're all invited to graduation. Uh, so think about uh, in the coming weeks whether or not you want us to save seats for you. Um, we'll we'll want to talk about uh, that. Um, and I don't know that now is the appropriate time, but I don't think we'll have another meeting before graduation necessarily. Uh, but usually one of the board members is up on stage handing out diplomas to students at graduation. And it's, it's usually who wants to do it and if there's a special connection to the, the group of students that's, that's coming up on stage. I did it with Lisa last year. Yeah, is there anybody who would um particularly like to do it i'm pretty sure i'm going to be at a soccer tournament unfortunately and rob pretty sure i'm going to be at the same one yeah. <laughs> yeah. i'm pretty yeah, sure I'm it was the that. same one unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> what did you say Sharon? i said unfortunately i'll be at the same soccer tournaments <laughs> i just yeah. heard that rodney was rodney voluntold did, yeah. to do it yeah. go moose <laughs> Yeah, well, I think we do great. Yeah, I think we get to it. Yeah. I always bowed in the one who's not here to defend himself. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, I know uh, you want me. <laughs> <laughs> we can uh we can coordinate over email maybe about finding somebody able to do it. I'll I'll talk to Rodney, see if he's able to. Or Peggy. Or Peggy. I was nominating Rodney. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, you couldn't quite understand what you said, Peggy. What did you say? I, I said I was nominating Rodney. Okay. Rodney <laughs> did. I'll, I'll talk about this. Thank you guys for that. I mean, I guess the one comment I want on the, well, it's interesting because I didn't know that we were going to talk about this so much in detail, but I had a question that I was going to bring to the board at some point. <clears throat> Uh, in, in a kind of go with this. So, I mean, the, the numbers are alarming, right? And it's not like you could just point your finger at the elementary school or the middle school or the high school because it seems like they're all double, if not triple, the uh, number of referrals year over year, which, you know, is pretty alarming. But some of the information I get from parents, but mostly my kids. Um, and, I'm sure, and I'm sure it's 
you know, looking at this data, there's no picking on one identity. It looks like it's kind of widespread. Is I wonder what the true data really is when I say referrals, because from what I hear, it sounds like often teachers will allow uh, more things to happen in the classroom now than maybe they would have a couple of years ago. Um, you know, that same person that does the same trick every day, um, or some of the at the middle school, some of the language that's being used in around class time that the teachers now will say they'll hear it and they do this, you know. Mm. So what are these real numbers look like and and how do we, you know, not discipline, but how do we get our message across that this behavior is not acceptable, you know, and then, you know, I, I'm not up with the policy standards of what our disciplinary policies are, but maybe we need to re-examine those. Um, because you know these numbers jumping year over year is, you know, pretty alarming. But, I mean, I would think. I think a couple well, of things. Put them in context. So I mean, we've undergone a you know a pretty dramatic impact nationwide, you know, worldwide with the pandemic and that whole impact. And you know, yeah. I mean, last year there was not the having gone to that. Academy, so you know, would the, not, what would the numbers look like? Yeah. You know, and will they level up over time? Mm -hmm. And so while we need to plan for, you know, maybe think in context of if this type of event were to hit us again, how do we plan for it? But will it level, you know, as, as we get away from it and back to a more normal routine, will it uh, uh, change over time? <laughs> that's why it's so important to look at this with surveys and action plan to talk about proactively what you're going to do and reactively what we're going to do and all be on the same page. Yeah. And I think next year too, there's a, a, a shift towards how we're going to use our half days and there's been some really clear guidance from the superintendent about that and that we're going to focus on SEL on the, some of those half days. And I don't think that this year, looking back, like we were still COVIDing and doing so much of this on the computer and it was, it's hard to do PD on the yeah. computer. So I think we have a lot more opportunities to make sure that we're aligned with what we're doing between classrooms, which we're, we've been so close into our classrooms the last two years. So I totally agree. We got to make sure that a kid in one classroom is getting the same messaging as a different classroom. Yeah, and um, I guess kind of going back to what Chris was saying a little bit about um, how just like it should be known for like all teachers, parents, students, what exactly is being enforced for different actions. Because personally, um, it, at the high school, different teachers have different, in, like enforce different things than other teachers. So I feel like it, there is not like a clear, concise, like this is what's gonna happen if you do this. Um, for example, there was a kid yesterday um, practically not wearing a shirt around school, and to my knowledge, he was not dress coded for it. Um, and I just feel like I don't know who's like who that was or whatever that decided that was like just fine. But um, I just think that it's it would be great if everyone just knew exactly like what would happen if kids did like certain things. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think that comes to when I talk about building a system that's what i mean right yeah. like that all teachers and students like we have agreed upon school-wide expectations mm -hmm. and anyone any and everyone should be able to say what those are and what that looks and sounds yeah. like in each area of the building and that we hold everyone accountable to those mm -hmm. and that you know my favorite saying is when i when i used to do a lot of consulting work on this is we don't do independent contractors right like you don't get to just say, well, in this room, actually, the rule is this. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not a system, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And so I've been talking a lot to your principals about how do we ensure we have accountability to a universal system mm -hmm. and that it, where I sit, that certainly all students, but all employees understand that that vision around when we say we, we mean all of us, mm -hmm. is how we do our business. Yeah. Yeah, so I appreciate that a lot. Yeah, thank you. And the follow-up piece that though is once you get to that vision, start making sure we communicate that out to the parents so mm -hmm. you know they understand what the 
limitations are going to be and what is and in theory will be uniformly enforced. And so. I think if I may, um, anecdotally, this is anecdotally, right? What we're doing, I can tell you also anecdotally. I know Andrew makes calls every night to parents or emails. We contact pam parents all, every day we have a contact set, right? And not everything gets written up. I use the filters and I know Andrew has done it too and, and read is, was that respectful? Was that responsible? Was that safe? Was that kind? Everybody knows the answer to that if you're talking to them about that shirt or the hands-on behavior, all grades. They know, or if they don't, then you sit and work with them. The independent contractor is the danger. The other piece that I don't think you're talking about at all is there's some kids that are in the programming that have different um, access points that they might be coming out of that personalized learning class. And we're gonna do that very privately. And you see that. Mm -hmm. Kids are treated differently because every kid is different, but there is a standard we have to have. And I appreciate you saying something, Chris, and I know where both your children attend school. <laughs> oh, all you have to do is just call me and I'll take care of it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that your daughters that's are talking to you, contract, which I like. <laughs> but we they, hear the they truth. know what the rules are. <laughs> but we hear the truth from kids. Right. I was saying it because sure, your absolutely. kids are talking to you. Yeah. Yeah. I also know having been a parent, when the three of them are in the back seat, three friends, you're getting a lot of information oh, that sure. happened that oh, day. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I mean it comes down to behavior. I mean behavior isn't being responsible in the classroom than learning. That's right. So, I mean, we're all here to learn, so okay. absolutely. Yep. Well, thank you. All right, um, should we move on to the business manager, Tara? Good evening, everyone. There she is. She's at the ball. So game. you have? Yeah. Yep. She's muted. Yeah, muted, Tara. I can't hear you, Tara. She didn't have the mute. Yeah, it doesn't say that. Oh, no, she's muted. muted. Huh? Her volume is off. Yeah, we can't hear you, Tara. Okay. Did that work? Oh, still can't. I can hear her. Oh, really? really? Oh, oh okay. we can't yeah. hear her. That's weird. Turn on the closed captioning. We can read yeah. what she's saying. <laughs> <laughs> well done. There you go. Man. We can try that. I'm not going to guarantee Sometimes it's not people. super accurate. Does, but. does that work better? Everybody else stop talking. Hey, we can read you. Yes. We can't hear you. But we can I can read. still hear you. That's so weird. That I can hear weird. her as well. Awesome. Okay. Maybe log out and come back in, Tara, and just see. Okay. I'll try that. <laughs> oh, perfect. Hey. That's quick work, did that do it? Hey. Who needs tech? <laughs> right. I mean, don't. I don't often turn it back on. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that worked. So, yes, Bethel just beat Chelsea in the minors baseball game. Woo! <laughs> so, you all have my report. It outlines the events that are happening in the business office for the month of May. And then I also provided the quarter three projections. So Parker, if you could put that up on the screen, please. So we start on the expenditure side. Uh, overall, we still are having areas of savings and salaries of $56,000. Health insurance, your budget versus the updated enrollment was 17,000. And then your other benefits, which are workers' compensation, dental, unemployment, life, long-term disability, et cetera. We are saving about 120, just shy of 127,000. So overall, the current projected savings on the expenditure side of the budget is $200,244. And then we move to the revenue side. It's getting dark. Sorry, I got to hold it closer. Uh, the tuition, we have a shortfall of just over 14000 We have more pre-K revenue than we budgeted for, which is fantastic. We have more interest income than we budgeted for as well. 
and we've received additional miscellaneous revenue. We do have a shortfall in the rentals, which is clear with not having our buildings open to the public all year. And then we have donations on there, but we haven't received, or sorry, student activities. We haven't received any funds there transferred from the student activity funds to the general fund. And then we've received $910 in donations. We received a little less in the transportation aid, and that's the reimbursement that you receive for your home to school transportation. And that's a formula that's given to us uh, by the Agency of Education each year, and they determine how much they're going to reimburse us. So we were shy about $3,000 there. Uh, and then um, we'll get the vocational transportation reimbursement, driver's ed reimbursement. Um, we haven't received the last semester, so that usually comes um, towards the end of the year. And then we haven't received any reimbursements for adult learning. We're still on target for all of our title grants and Medicaid revenue from the supervisory union. So right now there's a projected shortfall in the revenue of 30,808. Then we have the savings on the expenditure side of $200,244. So still currently projecting a surplus uh, to be $169,436. And then again, just the fund balances down below are as of the end of fiscal year 21, which was your last completed audit. And if there's any questions. Tara, we took out that um, that student line, that $12,000 in the next budget. Is that correct? Student I, activities. I believe we did, but I don't have yeah, that okay. budget. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there. we did. Yep. I, I thought it would have it's come not out something budget, we get but... very often so it would yeah, yeah. No. I do think we took it we out did. I knew we took it out I just I guess it's next budget <laughs> yep. all right unless there's anything else for Tara um we'll move on to the policy committee thank you yeah policy is that you Shan who's on the policy committee not me that's, That's Rodney. Not on. <laughs> Rodney. It's Rodney. Yeah. Um, you're on several committees with me. Um, and so I'll just give a, a quick update on the policy committee. The SU board will be seeing a draft of a social media policy um, that's geared toward uh, employees, contractors, anyone that works within the, the supervisory union. Um, and it will speak to appropriate uh, use of social media as an employee and what that looks like um, as far as leveraging it to communicate with students um, through and families through like a professional Facebook page um, or Twitter account or something like that and then versus what we would expect someone to do via private social media. That's with our attorney right now. Um, she felt pretty good about the, the last draft that we just sent to her. So the policy committee will receive that on Monday night and they do, I do expect that they're gonna to wanna to talk about it at the full board. Um, and then the other one that we're looking at right now um, is a policy um, in regards to um, tuition uh, school choice districts, which are the only district in the SU that doesn't have a school choice. Um, but if we are looking at, uh, looking at an SU policy around um, school choice districts and uh, paying up tuition um, of students that includes an affidavit process when students initially enroll. enroll. It um, will require the RUD district to work with those school choice districts, at least within our organization, to gather that information if a student was to move in at the high school level. Right now we do have a annual tuition uh, residency verification form, which is a lot more simpler than this affidavit process is gonna be. Um, it also spells out the process that a board would use if a student's residency was in question um, prior to paying tuition. It also gives me some more teeth. I've been really clear with um, receiving districts, including this one, um, that our choice districts are not paying unless that district works with us to certify residency. So it's putting a little onus back on the receiving district where before they used to just bill us and expect that we would pay it. And I'm saying, no, we're not paying you until you help us provide residency. Um, and so we've been really successful with that around um, making certain that we're able to get folks to certify 
that they're actually living in that that choice district. Um, and so that policy has a lot of support at the SU level um, to move forward. So the SU board will see that as well. Um, and those are the two policies that are almost in, uh, my ex expectation would be that we'd be able to adopt those in August, that we'll get readings hopefully in June, um, and then that we would look for warning and adoption possibly in August. Social media one, I would, I'm hopeful that we could definitely try to get that in place so that that could be part of our staff handbook um, as we return to school. Uh, the tuition verification policy, that's not gonna put more burden on our administration as far as... Well, the burden will get put on the uh, registrars. Yeah. Yep. To um, make certain if a student essentially was to move in initially, that they complete this affidavit form. Um, and what I mean by that is sending them back to whatever district they live in and working with their registrar. And our registrars meet actually with these early release days now, our, our registrars all meet um, often on our early release days. Um, and so this is part of a topic for conversation um, and it will be making certain that those families complete that. I think it'll help them, the registrars. I do too. Okay. More structure. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about proposed policies or <clears throat> policy committee? Does, does the school choice between the campuses need to be mentioned at all? Or is that just different? That's, no, that's different. Okay. That's intra-district school choice, which we have okay. policy on. Um, this is for tuition paying districts. Okay. okay. I guess the policy committee might talk about flag policy. And right, and now oh, flag yeah. policy. Okay, task force updates. Who's up first? Hmm. Oh, we can go first. Recruitment, Recruitment and marketing. Um, I can just quickly, we haven't seen each other, but I think we need to go to Jeff on this one. Wildcat night. Yeah, yeah so. Uh, we are Wildcat Night. It was a great evening of uh, showcasing who we are. Uh, the faculty did a great job. They were in the and the uh, tours were fabulous as well. Faculty and students. Yes, and students. There were so and students. parents. So when you walked in the gym, it was uh, the athletic boosters, and then there was all the classes and introduction to them. Uh, ben was there doing flexible pathways. It was, I don't know, it was a really great night for me as far as. Me and the new principal meeting a lot of different um, parents and, and students coming in. We had food, and uh, I just thought it was fabulous. It was a great evening of who we are and who we want to be. And I think we need to do more of that, actually, and maybe even go on the road somewhere. They have, you know, we can showcase. I know years ago when I was here at South Burlington, Deptford had an open gym, and all the schools were there, and all the students and parents went to that. And so it was a great evening. I mean, there was a slideshow. Jillian did a slideshow. Phenomenal evening. So. Music boosters were there. Yeah, drama, sports yeah. teams, coaches. Clubs, classes, coaches. Yeah. And it was a packed auditorium. And that's an odd gym. That's a big gym. Yeah. And the parking lot was full and everybody drove well. Yeah, so, you know, and we had to sign up by our sign in when the parents came. and. Unfortunately, the line was so big, a lot of parents just sort of bypassed and went in. So we had, I think, 26 or 8 parents sign up, their students and whatnot, but there was a lot more that didn't sign up, unfortunately. Yeah, but we gave out bumper stickers. So, um, and part of the recruiting thing that we're doing next is just sending out a letter to the 6th and 7th graders to introduce who we are and sort of keep, keep that going so it's not... I think by eighth grade, a lot of students have made their choice of what school they're interested in. So we're trying to get to them a little earlier. And then uh, yesterday we met on a web page, and our, our new web design is phenomenal. It's really exciting. When I first applied for this position, I looked on our website to get information, and it was just, uh, geez. Not really good. It was unavailable. <laughs> yeah. And it was not updated. It was really weak. And I was like, Wow, because I mean, nowadays, mm -hmm. the first thing people do is they go to that. Yeah. So I'm, it's, I'm really proud of it, and it looks really good. And I think anybody that's looking at our school will look at that and go, wow, 
it's a great school. I didn't realize that was happening. I just want to say thank you. For years now, I've hoped that that would happen, be updated. I can't, it's been so hard to find anything on there. Yeah. That's amazing. And it is the face of the school, so it's awesome. Yeah. So that's good. I got to give credit to uh, came down from John, Jamie Ray to Kate McLean. Kate's been really doing an incredible job. That's great. And the task force has been helpful also. This Friday, the three principals are going to tighten up the final edits and it will launch. Wow. We know we want it sooner than later, but it is a lot of work, first yeah. of all, and it is beautiful. I'm really proud of it. That's exciting. We should also acknowledge Kendra Cole, who's been Thank the you. collector and on She's people amazing. about getting stuff in, and mm -hmm. Angela also on the Bethel campus. The two, yeah, the two of them, we couldn't do it without them. Yeah. So and we're going to uh, we're going to launch that website now, but it still needs um, some fleshing out. And so I'm looking forward to what our um, principals come up with next year throughout the year uh, for videos with students, with faculty, different arts, academics, and athletics sort of things to put on the prospective student page. Um, so I think it'll be a really great tool where it hasn't been in the past. That's yeah, that is call. great. Um, can part of this work be setting up the procedures or, you know, responsibility for keeping it updated? Because uh, that is know, we... part of it. Um, there will be someone on each campus who will be updating information. So. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't know if there's some way to have, you know, like at the end of each year, beginning of each year or something like that, somebody go through the web page and make sure everything actually, you know, has the updated handbook and the policies or whatever else. Part of uh, Kate McLean, who, who we've been using for ESSER money to really push forward this idea of some better proactive communication um, for the SU. She's helped build it. each district has a new website now. We're, we got Sharon Lapton in the WRBSU page, but part of her job mm -hmm. responsibilities moving forward is to do what, just what you're saying. When she's not actually building the web pages, it's to make certain that they're current yeah. um, and that they stay current. Never notice that something's out of date until you go to work for it. Right. Yeah. That's right. Great. Okay. Um, any questions for recruitment and marketing? And we'll move on to child care summer program. So we had our first meeting a little later than I wanted to because I had COVID. Um, but uh, it was good. We get together. Um, and I think we decided uh, we took all the preschool stuff that we had done and um, started looking at where we we're going to send out a parent letter to try to gain more people for the task force. Uh, but I think the team agreed instead to start with the survey. And you can weigh in, Shannon, if I'm remembering this wrong. Uh, and then via the survey, ask if people wanted to be involved in the task force. So uh, we had a small but short, quick little meeting, and we all have homework, and we're all going to work on the survey and tuning that up, and then we have a next meeting date um, to try to get that survey out as soon as possible. I will say I think there was a big discussion about I think we want to save the world, and I get it, I totally get it, and we want to make sure there's childcare for everybody. But I followed up with Superintendent Kanarni. He really wants the scope of this to be school age childcare. Um, so just that I wanted to refine our focus because I know I think in our meeting it was a little bit back and forth. And I know there is also still the pre-K task force, which hasn't met recently, but is still still going to be. Well, in phase to two, just so the board knows that the pre-K was to expand child care for pre-K. So the idea was to get full day programming for this coming year but then to have extended child care. My hope would be by next well, year. Technically year. next year we're offering extended care for three-year-olds. Right. The year after to offer it even later. Right. In line with the capture program. Right. So I think that's, Shannon, what am I missing? I think that's it. Yeah, so that was important. I think we, um, we were a little bit confused about our marching orders. And um, so I think that's, that's great to uh, get a little clarification and We'll be coming up with with sort of high in the sky. What would it look like, and then what can we accomplish, and sort of set those priorities for what what um, low hanging fruit there might be, and then what else can we do? So I, th I think we'll be coming up with some sort of plan to present 
probably by fall. I don't think, you know, we've got to get the survey data back and, and um, so this, this isn't going to be something that launches unfortunately tomorrow, but um, we'll, we'll do an assessment of need and try and get as much as we can. Yeah. All right. Uh, we've already done the discussion item and action possible action items. Um, and an exe executive session. Right. For student. Okay. Um, so just need read. Do I have a Good. motion to enter executive no. session? So so we'll move on to the rest of the agenda. No hires resignations. You want to go over those? Yeah. So uh, the one resignation that we have is uh, Bridget Fortner, who was a, a administrative assistant for this building, this campus we had just hired her this year, um, has moved back to California. So her last day was Friday, April 29th. Um, she is working for us um, virtually through an MOU um, to just help us with attendance still virtually. She's able to pull that off and a couple other special projects. Uh, the good news is um, we've been able to hire Melissa Perkins, who had grown up in this area and who has served as a paraprofessional um, within the supervisory union um, and also was a hairdresser um, up here at Sherry's headquarters. Um, and so Melissa is going to be coming on as an admin assistant this fall. Um, and then, of course, we were able to uh, finally hire Kendra permanently um, as an admin assistant. And so I think that's good news. Those were two positions that we had struggled filling since last August. Um, I feel really good um, about both of their abilities to connect with our community, um, to be the, you know, the face of the building, because admin assistants are that face, right? The, the, the first person often folks see. Um, and really have a good sense and knowledge of um, the local community. So I, I feel really good about that. Um, and then the other hires that we had, I asked the principals to put in their actual report. Um, and so I'm really, and there's a couple more in the pipeline that haven't met with me yet. So they're not actually ready for recommendation. Um, I do meet with everyone that we bring on board. And so, the teaching staff that we're able to bring on is we have someone member holly brennan cook is retiring um, so we were able to find a third grade teacher who i'm really excited about um, that's coming to us from um, a charter school in new york city who has four years experience um, and maggie's ability to speak to what a math instructional block looks like was really exciting um, and has actually already joined the um, Rudd Vertical uh, Math Group um, to do some uh, elementary math uh, PD and planning this summer. So that was really exciting. Um, remember, we added uh, a pre-K uh, for next year. Um, and so what you have there is um, Natalie Williams, who's been a paraprofessional for you, has her credentials to be a pre-K teacher. So she's coming on board. Uh, Anda made a switch in assignment, so that's where that other pre-K teacher comes on board. Um, and so with Kristen, Kristen um, comes to us from Washington Village School. Um, and prior to that, also was a paraprofessional for a long time at SLPA. I really enjoyed my interview with her. Having that background as a speech language pathologist um, can do nothing but serve our earliest learners so well. Um, as when we think about developing language, uh, both receptive and expressive. Um, and then Gabby is coming to us from Norwich University, uh, where she was a student teacher um, and is, is joining our team. I would say that the Norwich University program is one that I'm looking to try to strengthen our relationship with. They've done a complete overhaul of their ed department over the last five years. Um, and we were able to hire two graduates from Norwich at Rochester Stockbridge last year who have done exceptionally well um, and, and are returning um, for this upcoming year. So I feel really good about trying to strengthen the partnership there. Um, and then Laura Levitt is coming to us 
Um, I'm really excited about her hire. We have a teacher who's being reassigned from South Rolls Elementary 4-5 to the middle school math um, for next year, who has middle school math credentials as well. Um, and so that had an opening there at 4-5. That's where that 4-5 opening came from. Um, and so that um, Laura Levitt grew up in Pomfret and had done her student teaching at Woodstock High School and had been teaching out in California and came back and um, had other job offers, but really decided that this was the place she wanted to come work, which was really excited and has actually moved to the community and um, her students will be attending our districts. So um, I'm really excited about, she has a strong background in math science, um, which I think is gonna uh, pair really well um, with our four or five team. Who's the teacher who's moving over to the middle school? Alicia Hannaford is going to go back to middle school again yeah. um, after a long time in elementary. Um, and she's excited about that. And I certainly support that, that decision. Tammy, raise your hand. I have a feeling she needs our attention about executive session. You can read my mind. Yeah, no action taken. Great. Came out Thanks. Oh, Thanks. Sorry, Tammy. Uh, is there any public comment? Probably should have asked this before. That's all right. Sorry. Sorry. Executive Thanks. session. But... <laughs> all right. Oh, yeah, we put that executive session. I missed it. You guys have two public comments. Um, we don't have any others, so future agenda items will have the spring academic data report. Is that going to be next month, I guess? Yep. And, and I've got EI coming back. Um, and so uh, that will be, they'll start to give you a sense of their projected square foot cost on um, any type of like capital improvements, but, you know, thinking roofs, things like that. Um, but also specifically windows, lighting, HVAC, boilers, um, fresh air. Um, the only thing I would add to that is that the good news is Efficiency Vermont has been in close contact with us about wanting to use some of their money to support our work in the SU, which I'm happy about. Um, you know, ESSER, we still have about probably 1.3 million um, set aside to help support some of this work across the SU. Um, you know, I think SU wide, you know, we're looking at over 10 million in work to do around our HVAC systems and things of that nature. Um, and in general, the state, um, that was the other legislative report that I wanted to share. I'm really excited that the state um, did set aside 22 million for PCB abatement. Um, I knew there was one more thing in that legislative report. Now, do I know if that's gonna be enough? No, but at least it's something. Because uh, we are starting PCB testing in this SU um, this month, um, and we expect the results by the fall. Um, so at least they did put some money away for abatement. So anyways, EI will be on the agenda for next month. All right. I think we have reached the end of our meeting. So I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, June 21st at 6 p.m. in Bethel. I'll move. Okay. Yeah.